Has the recent rally in stocks made you a little nervous, thinking maybe valuations have gotten ahead of themselves? Well, how about investing in companies before they're actually public? How do you do that? For his thoughts, I'm joined by Marty Zwilling. He is founder and CEO of Startup Professionals. Marty, very good to see you. Well, Rhonda, it's very good to see you. It's very good to be here and to uh, hopefully bring a little information about startups. That's my life. <laughs> well, it's interesting because I think a lot of people think about startups. You know, in a lot of people's dreams, they want to start their own company. But if, if you don't have the moxie or the financial wherewithal to do that, maybe you can invest in somebody else's startup. How do you go about doing that as an investor? Well, it's actually quite different from investing in regular stock. I myself am what's called an angel investor, and so that's a common term. That simply means that you're investing your own money as opposed to venture capitalists who invest institutional money. But uh, in general, it's a, a lot of work. In other words, you have to actually do all the research yourself. You don't have any uh, market analysts or you don't have any stock market tracking to tell you which startups are good. So, you know, I recommend that you start slowly. And by starting slowly, let's say you're doing the research and you're, you really want to get into this, what kind of money are we talking about for an investor? Can you invest in a startup for as little as a, f a few thousand or do you have to make a bigger commitment? No, certainly from an angel standpoint, uh, 25,000 is, is a kind of a normal entry point. Some people invest larger amounts. There's actually a new approach these days, which is called crowdfunding, that would allow you to get into a startup for maybe $20. So it doesn't take a lot of money to get in. And in fact, I always recommend that you invest in several startups, smaller amounts, rather than put all your eggs in one basket. And then here's the tricky thing, return on investment. <laughs> what should investors look for? What should they expect? What should they be willing to part with in terms of their own money? Well. It's, it's a very risky thing. Uh, most people don't realize that about nine out of 10 startups fail. So uh, the reality is that most investors in startups, uh, angel investors, for example, expect uh, and shoot for a 10 to one return. And you know people say, well, that's very high. But in fact, if you think that maybe nine out of 10 of your investments are going to fail, uh, you really need a very large kind of return. So that's the kind of ROI calculation that most investors start with. And would you advise that investors stick with a sector or a business that they're at least familiar with? Absolutely. You know, it's, it's one of those things that uh, just because everybody's investing in Facebook or, or social media and you don't know anything about that, you should jump in wrong. You should definitely stay in your own business domain if you're familiar with chips, if you're familiar with software then that's the right place to invest because, again, there's nobody going to be doing the, uh, the research for you. So the more you know, the more risk you can eliminate from the equation and, in fact, the more contribution you can make because half of investing in startups is helping the startup as opposed to simply looking for a big financial return. And how do you do your homework? You know, to your point, if you invest in a publicly traded company, there's a lot out there. So how do you go about doing the homework? What should you be looking for when you're researching some of these companies to invest in? Even if it's as little as $20, it's still your $20. So how do you do that due diligence? Well, you should ask the startup CEO or the company for a business plan and, and start with reading the business plan. If they don't have a business plan, I wouldn't invest. I mean, there's simply, uh, if you have people with an idea, magic idea, ideas aren't worth much. And so you really need a plan that shows that they have done their homework themselves on the market opportunity. It's a large opportunity. They have identified competitors. They've made projections financially to show that they can reach uh, a good level of revenue in five years. I always ask for a five-year projection. I ask for, uh, look for a projection that goes maybe $20 million in five years to show that this is a high growth opportunity. It's not one that's maybe a good family business, but not investable. So there are a whole series of uh, financial markers and, and uh, kind of competitive positions that uh, I think you would learn over time. So one of the things that uh, goes with investing, certainly angel investing, is that you often should find a local investment group where 
you can kind of rely on a little bit of help from some other investors who maybe have been there and done that for a while. Marty, how does an investor get out? Do you have to wait for an IPO? What if you just decide, I put some money in, I, I want to leave, I'm happy when I was there, but how do you actually go about doing that? Well, that's, that's a good trick. You, you really shouldn't expect to get out within, uh, until there's a, some kind of a liquidity event. An IPO, for example, that's the time you're going to get out. So I tell every investor, you should be in it for the long term. You should expect nothing for three to five years. There, there are no dividends. There's, there's no market uh, for the stock. So you essentially own stock that you can't sell. And, and uh, if they get acquired, if they get bought, if they do an IPO, then in fact, you are out. So uh, all investment in startups are, are in fact long-term investments. All right, Marty Swilling, thanks so much. It's been good talking to you. Appreciate it. And be sure to check the Reuters Insider platform every day at 1 p.m. for more wealth strategy segments. I'm Rhonda Schaffler. This is Reuters.